I'll ask you to get your Bible and go with me to the book of Luke and find Luke chapter 23. And I'm going to read a couple of verses this morning. I do want to give you forewarning. If you came looking for a light-hearted, pat-on-the-back Easter sermon, you had done come to the wrong place. But the good news is you'll be out in time to still go get one of those somewhere else. So if you don't like what you got, your options are still wide open for the day. It won't be like it was several years ago. I had started a series on the afterlife and the way the Lord laid it out. I ended up preaching a message on hell on Easter Sunday morning. And uh, the Lord was in it. We had several saved. But it did ruin the chocolate bunnies of several that were in attendance. And it just wasn't what they had signed up for. But we around here are madly in love with the Word of God. And we have decided that this book is better than any story. It's better than any illustration. It's better than any feel-good chat we could have. Life is in the Word of God. Are you in Luke chapter 23? If you are, holler, Amen. I'm going to begin reading in verse 39. and We're going to read down through verse 46. And I'm going to bring you something that I could not get away from. God, no doubt, buried this in my heart for this morning. Verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, I love those red letter words, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me, say the last two words out loud, in paradise. Father, open up the scripture. Bless that which I have committed to study. God, bring it to my mind fresh. May it be preached with power that is not mine, an unction that I have nothing to do with. And God, would you do a great work here today. In Christ's name, I so thankfully pray. Amen. I would like to ask you a question today and then I will attempt to help us answer that same question. We understand that Jesus died a literal death. I'm going to need an amen right here. He was not in a coma for three days. He was not asleep for three days. He literally died. They took the body of Christ and placed it in a grave or a tomb. On the third day after that final 24-hour period of time, 72 hours later, at the breaking of sunlight, Jesus miraculously arose from the grave. And we all say, Amen. And we'll all eat Reese's peanut butter eggs in celebratory action. Amen. And if you don't like... It being Easter candy, just look at them like little gravestones. Amen. Just roll them out of the way and eat them. Praise God. Now we believe that. But let me ask you this. Where was he during those three days? Where was Jesus? His body we know is separate from who he was. His body was in that tomb. But where was Jesus? And what was he doing When he was there. So the question is, where was Jesus during the three days his body was in the grave? This is my message. I want to talk to us about the work of Christ's spirit as his body lay dead. Now he says in his conversation with the thief on the cross, Today I will be with you in paradise. So we know that when he left his body on the cross that his eternal spirit immediately went to paradise. But this begs the question, what 
was or is paradise and where was or where is paradise. Well, the easiest way to define what something is is to learn the definition of the word. And the word paradise itself literally means a place of future happiness. Paradise is a place of future happiness. Let me illustrate. How many of you, your easy chair will be paradise later today? It is a place of future happiness. Amen. Now, it is in reference to an idea more than it is a physical location. Paradise is used in your Bible two other places. And it is always in reference to a place of future happiness. How many of you would say, the beach is coming, preacher? I'm hearing you preaching. I understand. All right? So Jesus went to paradise where that saved thief was going. It was a place of future happiness. But where... Is that or was that? Well, in Matthew chapter 12 in verse number 40, Jesus said very clearly that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. The heart of the earth. Some would say that's the grave. Listen to me. Our graves are six foot deep. Theirs were above ground. You're not going to tell me that six feet under is the heart of the earth. Neither is a hole in a rock on a mountainous hillside. This is not in reference to his physical body being put in a grave. This is his words about the location of his spirit upon his death. He said, I will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So in correlation with what Jesus promised the thief on the cross and in correlation with Matthew 12, 40, we understand that at that time paradise was located in the heart of the earth. This is where Christ went immediately upon death. When he gave up the ghost, he immediately was in the heart of the earth in a place that was known to the Old Testament saints as paradise. Somebody said, well, preacher, what did he do there? Sit back, work on his tan, sip on a cold drink after a hard week's work? No, this is what he did in paradise. According to Paul in Ephesians 4, Paul said he ascended up on high. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, But now that he ascended, going up, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended or went down is the same also that ascended, went up far above all things, listen, that he might fill all things. Jesus took care of some very important matters when he left the cross in spirit and went to the heart of the earth. Somebody said, preacher, what were those matters? Well, I I can't get too sidetracked, but I will say this. He went down to claim authority over everything under the earth. While he lived here for 33 and a half years, he claimed authority over everything on the earth. And bless the Lord, when he went back to glory, he passed through every galaxy that ever has been and he claimed authority over everything above the earth. I'm trying to tell you, wherever you go, he's already God. Amen. Hallelujah. So what did he do in paradise in the heart of the earth? How did he he ascend or ascend and how did he descend and how did he feel all things in his descension into the heart of the earth? The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3 that Christ preached unto the spirits in prison that had gone there in disobedience to the word of God. Now, 
I, I want to say something. In case you have wandered through this territory before, let me clarify something to you. There are a lot of people will say that that is in reference to him only uh, going to deal with demons that had run rampant on the earth in the days of Noah. But the word spirit there is the same word for our spirit. It's the same word for spirit that he commended into the hands of his father. It is my belief that when Jesus went to paradise that he then preached to those lost souls that died without faith in the work of God and they were isolated in prison or to be very clear they were already suffering in the flames of hell. 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also hath once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust. Somebody else shout right there. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, in his body, but quickened, come alive, by the capital S, Spirit, Holy Spirit. Now here it is, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, those that were contained in the heart of the earth which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So he, in the heart of the earth, in paradise, he preached to those that had died without faith in the word of God. Now I can tell the gears are turning. And some of you, we've already got in your basket and cracked your eggs. It's okay. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Somebody said, preacher, how could he be in paradise with the saints and preach over into hell to those that were lost and had died without faith in the word of God? I'm thankful that the Bible in its clarity gives us an up-close look at life after death before Calvary. And that look is found in Luke 16. You may be familiar with the story of Lazarus and the rich man at whose gate he sat. The Bible tells us, and this is not a parable. The Lord never used people's real proper names in parables. It would say a certain man or it would say a person or a woman but he uses a proper name. This is a real story that he had access to because he's God and he knows everything. And The Bible says that it came to pass that the beggar died. That's Lazarus. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now what does that mean? It means that when he died, he went to where Abraham was. Look at me. He was not literally in Abraham's bosom. He was where he had access to Abraham's bosom. He could lay upon... That's how real this place is. It was a place where the Old Testament saints already were. This man had faith in Christ. This man had faith in the coming Christ. He had faith in the Word of God. He was a saved man and when he died... Instantly, instantly, he was in paradise with the saints of days gone by. Now, as Paul Harvey would say, for the rest of the story. The Bible says that the rich man died, listen, and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes. When the saved man died, he was in paradise with Abraham from days of old and saints of days gone by. When the lost man died, instantly he was in hell, and he said, I am in torment, I thirst. He was in the physical place of hell. Now, somebody said, all right, I get it, but how would Jesus preach to those spirits that were there if he was in paradise? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Bible tells us in verse number 25 and 26 of Luke 16 that that rich man was able to cry out to Abraham. God allowed Abraham to hear and respond. And then Abraham said this, Between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. Abraham in paradise 
was able to communicate to the lost man in hell. It is my belief that when Jesus died, he went straight to paradise. And in the same way Abraham communicated with the rich man, Jesus was able to look across that divide and preach to those souls that had died without faith in the work of God. Now, understand this, that in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible tells us that after, that after he was in paradise, he is now seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father. The Lord did not stay in paradise. But for three days he was there. And for three days he was able to communicate to the other side. And I believe that he preached to those souls. Somebody said, what did he say? We don't know. Wouldn't you like to have heard that sermon? He was not giving them an opportunity for redemption. Here's what I believe he said. He references that these were souls that died, some of them, in the days of Noah. Here's what I believe he said. I believe he said, hey, y'all remember when you laughed at Noah? Do you remember when you mocked at Noah? Do you remember when you scoffed at my prophets and those that proclaimed I was coming? Well, guess what, boys? It's true. It was really true. Here I am. Noah was right. The prophets were right the message is really true and understand this and I want you to understand this very plainly some of you got more doctrine in the last 10 minutes than you've had in 20 years and it's good for you but I want you to understand this as a church and as a pastor and as a man of God and as a Christian we totally reject the idea that Jesus Christ died and his spirit went to hell to suffer in the flames of torment. Now some of you grew up in churches where they teach that, but I want to tell you this morning, that is absolutely, in my opinion, false doctrine. And I'm going to tell you why it is so false. Hallelujah. Because Jesus hanging on the cross uttered three words. It is finished. And when he said it is finished, he momentarily gave up the ghost. No man took his life. He laid it down. And when he gave up the ghost, payment had been made in full. If Jesus had had to go to hell and suffered in the flames of that judgment, it would not have been true that it is finished. But when he said it is finished, There was no more judgment required. There was no more payment necessary. What he had done between the Garden of Gethsemane down through Pilate's Hall and all the way to Golgotha, it was enough to pay for the sin of the world. And he did not have to spend one second in hell to pay for our sin. Our sin debt was paid for on Calvary. Hallelujah. Jesus said three words on the cross that concluded the work of Calvary. (laughs) It is finished. It's three words in our King James Bible, but in the original language it was one word. It was the word to tell us die. It was a common word in their day. It was not unusual for someone to say that word And Jesus knew it. He picked it on purpose. He cried out, Tetelestai. And it is translated into our Bible, It is finished. Here's what Tetelestai would often be used for in their time. When a farmer would awaken in the early hours of the morning and hear the lowing of a heifer giving birth out in the field or in the barn, He would light a lantern and run down to the place of this birthing. And he would watch and he would help and he would pull and he would nurse that cow through the birthing process. And when that calf came out 
And when that sack was torn and that little calf breathed oxygen for the first time and that mother would lower her head in the green grass of the pasture and take a deep breath of relief, that farmer would stand back, he would wipe the sweat from his brow and he would say to Telestai, it is finished, the pain is over and new life has begun. It is a word that an artist would use when they had painted an elaborate painting or chiseled a sculpture. They would work on it for days or months or even years. But when they would finally conclude that work of art, they would put the last brush stroke on it, put their signature or their stamp on it, And then that artist would step back, look at every angle, make sure that every detail had been attended to. And then that artist would say to Telestai, it is finished. Every bit has been wrought to perfect completion. There is nothing to be added. It is finished. A banker would use that term. If there was a loan that was outstanding, I'm about to have a spell this morning. And someone would come in to make that final payment. They would drop that sack of money down on the bank changer's table. He would take the notes and make an amendment to the account. He would see that there was nothing left to be paid, nothing left owed standing against them. That banker would then declare it paid in full. And he would do so by saying to Telestai, there is nothing left to be owed on the account. So understand this, when Jesus Christ with arms outstretched hung between heaven and earth uh, from east to west and north to south, the sacrificial body of Christ lay before God as an offering for the sin of mankind. He proclaimed to Telestai, the pain is over, new life has begun. The work is complete, nothing to be added. Bless the Lord, the debt is paid in full and mankind owes no more more on their account. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) When he gave up the ghost, he departed this world and he walked into paradise. No suffering in hell for the Son of God. He walked into paradise. Our sin debt had been paid complete. Can you see? (laughs) Glory. Can you see Jesus walking into paradise? And there's every saint from Adam all the way to Calvary who has had faith in the Word of God. And they may not have understood it completely, but they followed it wholly as best they understood. And now they've been awaiting this day in the heart of the earth. They're in a happy place. They're in a safe place. But oh, how they have longed for the day that the door would open and in would come the promised Messiah. I can see as Jesus walks through the door of paradise, that thief on the cross begins to jump up and down. He says, that's him, that's him. I told you he was coming. I told you he was going to be here shortly. Jesus walked into paradise. There reunited with saints who had never seen him in physical form, but had trusted by faith that he was coming. It is my belief that Christ died, surrendered his spirit into the hands of the Father, went to paradise which was in the heart of the earth, preached across the great divide into hell. Then, thank God on resurrection morning, he came back from the heart of the earth, ruling over death and the grave, conquering both so that he might have the key the authority, and the final say for all of eternity. And it was then upon his resurrection that he was seen by many witnesses. There's something unusual that happened in this text. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27 that when Jesus was on the cross, and you have to pay attention, 
When Jesus was on the cross, the Bible tells us that supernatural things began to take place on a natural planet. The Bible says when he yielded up the ghost, that the veil of the temple was rent in twain. There was a large veil that hung between the general area and the holy of holies. Man could not go behind that veil except once a year, prepared especially for that visit. But thank God when Jesus died, that veil was ripped, not from bottom to top, but from heaven to earth it was torn so that man could have access to the presence of God. Supernaturally, that veil was torn. The Bible then says that the earth did quake and that the rocks rent. I ain't got time to preach this, but I do have a message on it. Did you know that every rock on planet earth has a fault line in it? Every Go pick one up in the parking lot, but put it back. We need it. Every rock out there has got a fracture in it. It has a place where it has been broken. That did not happen at the quarry. That did not happen in the dump truck. That happened over 2,000 years ago when God's son died. The earth was torn into two pieces. Then the Bible says when the rocks were rent, the graves were opened. That was immediately upon his death. The graves were opened. But then there's a lapse in time and the author carries us forward three days and then comes back. And when he carries us forward three days, he says this, And many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. He said the graves opened at at his death, but after his resurrection, the saints got out of those graves, walked around, and was seen by many in Jerusalem. Now, I got news for you. It's my belief that the saints they saw walking around Jerusalem was not Moses. It was not Abraham. It was not Jonah. They would not have recognized Moses, Abraham, or Jonah. But you know who they would have recognized? Memaw. Because we buried her last week. But Mima ain't been in the ground but a week. But she got in on the first trip out. And they recognized those saints who had died in faith, believing that God was going to fulfill His word. And there were literal saints walking around Jerusalem that had died. And those, my friends, they were the first fruits of the resurrection when Jesus, hallelujah, when Jesus came out of paradise on that resurrection morning, he shut the whole place down. And he said, we're not going to need paradise anymore. Your Bible says that hell enlarges itself. It is my belief that when he came out of the grave, he took everybody in paradise with him. He let hell take over that space that is beneath your feet. If you don't believe in a literal hell, tell me why man with all of his science and with all of his knowledge and with all of his technology cannot go just a few miles below the surface before it is an impossibility. I'll tell you why they can't go from one side and come out on the other because there's a place in the middle that God has reserved for judgment. You can send me any little egghead professor you want and I'll tell him the same thing. If he wants to prove me wrong, he can take a little trip and I'll see him in China. (laughs) But they ain't going to do it because God has blocked off an eternal place there. And it's not far beneath us. And some of you, it's a lot closer than just a few miles because you're sitting here today lost and undone, playing games, dancing around eternity. And if you were to die today, You've never experienced the presence of God. Jesus emptied out paradise. Took all them Old Testament saints out. Said, y'all run down the house there and scare them real good before we go to heaven. That's in your Bible. And then, thank God, he walked this world and was seen of many witnesses. And then, the Bible tells us that he stood on the hillside. Hallelujah. And between the resurrection and the ascension, his work was not done. Understand this. 
that on the first resurrection Sunday morning, Mary came to him and in John chapter 20, she sees Jesus, verse 17. She sees Jesus and she is overwhelmed at his presence. She thought he was dead and now here he is alive. And Jesus said to her, does anybody want to finish it for me? Touch me not. He said, whoa, don't touch me. She was going to fall at his feet and worship. But he said, don't touch me. Why? For I've not yet ascended to my father. Now watch. She goes back and tells the disciples. And somewhere between that morning and that afternoon, it is my belief that he gathered up that blood. Hey, listen to me. Brother Buster Seaton said it like this. He said when they went to dispose of that cross and get it ready to use again, the blood of Christ was missing from the fibers of that wood. The robe that they put on him in mockery that was stained with his blood. The robe looked like it had just come from the cleaners. <laughs> the cloth that Joseph of Arimathea had wrapped him in. It was as pure linen as it was when he unpackaged it. That blood was supernatural. It was not corruptible blood. It was incorruptible blood. That blood was gathered up. And somewhere between resurrection morning and resurrection afternoon, he took that blood back to the Father, presented it as a sacrifice for our sin. Thank God satisfied the judgment of heaven, satisfied the holiness of God, satisfied the wrath of a righteous Father. And he came back to this earth because when he saw the disciples, he didn't say, touch me not. He said, hey boys, it's me. Touch me, feel me, handle me, see my hands, see my feet. Thomas, you, won't, you didn't believe it. Come put your hand in my side. The reason that they could touch him and Mary could not is because he was purified for the work of the high priest. And when he went back to the Father, he had dropped off that atoning blood and he came back as a witness of his resurrection. And he's standing out on a hillside. And he ascends up from that hillside, literally broke the power of gravity and ascended up into heaven. And the Bible said they was all standing around. You'd think they would be used to this kind of thing by now. But they stood around with jaws open, eyes bugged out. And two angels stood by and said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing? This same Jesus, just like he is ascending, he's coming back. Now you say, preacher, that's interesting. But what does that have to do with us? First of all, it tells us that he fulfilled all things that he said he would fulfill. Jesus did everything he said he would do. And if Jesus did everything he said he would do, then we can have confidence that he will do everything he said he would do. And here's two things that he said he would do. He said he would save every sinner that comes to him seeking for salvation. And secondly, he said he would come back and get everyone that belongs to him. This world is not my home. I'm leaving here one of these days. And I will either go in the rapture or I will go in the resurrection. The rapture is when the trumpet sounds and those that are alive who are saved, we will instantly, body and all, be carried into the presence of God by the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. I believe that. The resurrection is those who are saved that have died. Their bodies will be reformed from every particle from every place and they will be transported and we will meet them in the air whether you die before he comes or whether you're living when he gets here he's coming back for all that belong to him and I have faith that he did through his death, burial and resurrection what he said he would do and I have faith that he's going to do what he said he will do how about you? You know where you'll go today if you were to die? Do you know that he's your savior? Do you know what lies beyond the grave? I do. I do. You ask, get, get on Google. Ask Google what happens when we die. Google knows everything. It reminds me of Miss Amy. Come on, y'all say amen. 
Google knows everything, but you ask Google what happens when we die, and Google don't have a clue. Ask your professors. Ask the greatest minds that's ever lived. What happens when we die? And they have a guess at best. But this book has stood the test of time. And everything that Bible said was going to happen, it happened. And I believe that what it said will happen is going to happen.